And hello, it's 8.30, and welcome to 8.30 Prep. I'm Phil McCaffrey from 3R Prep, live from the studio in Ambridge. We have our, uh, what shall I call you, our illustrious producer, Damien, back with us working with Teo. Say hello, Damien. What's up? And Teo. Hello. All right, I got my guys behind the camera, and we are six feet apart, so things going. Oops, I've got to turn down my volume on my phone. I keep doing that. And I let the intro go. Another thing, so <laughs> tell, tell, tell me to turn it down. All right, so we've been working on Reading Rainbow all week. LeVar Burton, Please Do Not Sue Me. Is that on uh, uh, NPR? That's not NPR, uh, public public television. Is that like on um, where Sesame Street was? was it PBS, re- yeah. PBS, PBS, that's what I was looking for. Public broadcasting. Public broadcasting. Is public broadcasting going to sue me for my <laughs> reading rainbow infringement? Okay, so we're going to talk about standardized reading techniques, and this is a math nerd teaches reading. We're going to cut right to the chase, and I'm going to show you how to score on the SAT and the ACT. Both the SAT and the ACT have reading. The SAT now always has reading as section number one, the ACT always has reading as section three, and they are passages with questions. They're very similar, as we saw with Will earlier this week. The SAT has one unique question that the ACT has not incorporated, and that's the best evidence question. I'm not going to go over that. I will do another series probably closer to the tests on reading and get into some nitty-gritty detail. But today I'd like to show you how I do it and how I've been how I've developed a technique uh, really over the last 10 years of teaching the SAT and the ACT and why I love doing the ACT. Peyton says hey. Peyton says hey. He also got his prize today. He got his prize? Did he get his prize? What, what? My chat isn't coming up. Why is my chat not coming up? Broken. No, I have to refresh it. There we go. Peyton's on there. Hello, Peyton. Got his prize today. Peyton won, Peyton won the uh, contest. There's no contest today. Should have come up with a contest. There'll be a contest next week. So um, those Thursday thing maybe Thursday Thursday contest. So what I'm going to do is post um, some hard questions uh, that we will challenge at the end because we're going to go back to math next week and do. Uh, conjunction, junction, what's your function? So we're going to do functions on the ACT and the yeah, get SAT. Get back in your lane, Phil. All right, get back in my lane. i got to get back into math. We're going to do reading. I like doing reading. I got a really high reading score. Uh, I wasn't a good reader in high school. I, I work with a lot of boys who don't read. I didn't read a lot of novels. I wasn't fantastic at it. The one cool thing was there was a lot more vocabulary on the SAT when I took it, and I was lucky enough to have signed up for Latin, when I was in high school, and that really helped me. So the age-old question, the big question, is students always ask me, how do I improve my reading? How do I improve my reading speed? And that is, should I read the whole passage, or should I just skip to the questions? And the answer to that is always what every good test prep tutor says is, it depends. (laughs) And it depends on you. The one thing I am going to tell you is do what makes you feel the most comfortable taking the test. And we could talk about your brain structure and your prefrontal cortex and your memory and your hippocampus and your um, uh, um, um, amygdala. What's what's the word I'm looking for? What's the little part of your emotional brain? Uh, David would know this. Amygdala. Um, I can't even say it. I have to look it up on dictionary.com. It's it's a amygdala or something like that. that. Right. Amygdala. That's amygdala. Right. It, it, it's where your emotions are. It's what it's what makes you freak out. All right. And when you open up an, a standardized test, I don't care who you are. Your brain. It's the f- f- uh, what's called the fight or flight or freeze mechanism. So when you're scared of something, you either run away like, oh my god, I'm going to get my butt kicked, or you're like, I'm going to take this on, I'm going to kick it or you become a deer in the headlights. So when you open up to a passage, what do you do? Well, a lot of us go, oh my God, it's this huge thing with questions at the end of it. And I have a lot of students who will absolutely 100% read the whole passage, and I think they're wasting time. So what do we talk about here? And that is skimming, all right? And Will talked about that a lot. Skim or scan. A word that Will used earlier this week was prime your brain. 
So prime your brain with knowing where to find things in the questions. So Phil says, peek at the passage, skim a little bit, not too much. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because I want you to get to the questions. But for me, I want you to get to the answers. The questions you obviously have to read, but the answers are how you get paid, all right? So if this was Animal Crossing, these would be bells. This is currency. Anybody out there play Animal Crossing? Peyton, are you on, on, on Animal Crossing? It's a big game. What is, uh, what is, a, what is a coin in uh, Pokemon, Teo? A uh, Pokecoin? A Pokecoin? Is that what they call it, a Pokecoin? So, yeah. so these are Pokecoins, all right? These are Pokecoins. You only get, there are no style, like, uh, you know, the, the famous football coach in Pittsburgh here is Mike uh, Tomlin, and he said there are no style points in the NFL, meaning it only matters whether you win or lose. There's, there's no gracefulness. You don't get scored as if you were a, a figure skater in the Olympics, all right? You get scored on whether you fill in the right damn bubble. All right, here is my graphic of a passage. And I like to show this to students, and I'd like to point out that let's pretend this was a test about reading for high school students who are about 16 years old. Alrighty, slurp cam. He doesn't have the slurp cam. Oh, he doesn't have slurp cam. But that's uh, Damien's got it set up. Those tails. All right, slurp cam. So it, they're going to be about there's going to be about eight paragraphs somewhere in there, and you were taught to write using the five paragraph uh, style. So I'm gonna use the five paragraph style. And what is that? We've got the first paragraph here and we have the last paragraph here. And I ask students all the time, tell me what's in the first paragraph. So what's in the first paragraph? It is called the introduction. What is in the last paragraph? It is called the conclusion. Conclude. Let's conclude down here. And so I tell students, tell me what is in the introduction. And I get the wrong answer all the time. And that is this, the thesis statement. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, members of the jury, 12 people who are watching me online, and hopefully the 50 who will see this on Reddit because I posted it, and I'll get some views and some likes and some subscribes. There is no thesis statement on any passage on the SAT or the ACT ever. Zero. This doesn't exist. Let's just draw a big no. Never happens. All right. I made the middle paragraphs littler because they are support. All right. And in between the passages, there's transitions. And there's a nice transition. The transition between the last statement and the first statement is a great place to put a question. All right, and a really, really, really good place to put a question is right here, right here. This very, like, let's say there's four sentences in this paragraph or five sentences. The answer is going to be in the third or the fourth sentence, and I'm going to show you that. I don't have stats on this, and I am kind of a stats nerd, so I should sit down one day and go through this and count it all out and statistically do it, but... Then I would teach it. How would I teach that? I would say, look at the third sentence of the paragraph. No, find the damn answer is what I wanted to teach you. All right. So the other thing is I want to show you right now. When it says the main point, what is the main point? What is the purpose of this pa passage? The purpose is never in the introduction. The purpose is always in the conclusion. If you pick one of the answer choices that is a support, or if you pick one of the answer choices that is the introduction, you are wrong. If the answer choice does not exist in the last two paragraphs, it is not the main point. And I'm gonna show you that to you. Now we're gonna point it out to you. Hey, let's go to the technique. This technique is not for everybody. Reading the answers first is not for everybody. Skimming the passage and getting to the answers, everybody can learn to do that. But this is not a really good technique for every student. What is the best technique for you? The one that gets you to the answer and makes you feel comfortable, okay? I've had a student, I've had us students. I said I've had us students. I have had multiple students 
who had to read the entire passage. Otherwise, their amygdala would freak out and they would freeze. Okay, if you have to read the whole passage, read the whole passage. Great, do it. I don't. As a matter of fact, I do have a story about my wife, Teo's mother. When we first met, her, his older brother, Roy, had his SAT uh, answer booklet, the QAS, sitting on the dining room table the first time I ever met her. And I used to tutor students in a coffee shop, and I met my wife there. She was one of the baristas, and she was asking me, what is it that you do? with all of these students for 10 hours a day on a Saturday in a coffee shop. And I was like, I teach them how to read. She's like, do people really need to be taught how to read? This is a true conversation. And I said, yeah. And I picked up the SET booklet and I said, here, uh, you hold the answers. I'll just go to the questions. And I took a passage and I flipped it open just to the questions. And I read the questions and there were 10 questions and I got eight of them right. And the two that I didn't know the exact answer to, I I named which answer choices were wrong. So I was like, eh, I'm down between 50-50. The old SAT was beautiful. It was so standardized. It was so perfect. The new SAT is not. The ACT is, and I'm going to show you that. So do you read the entire passage before reading the questions? Sure, if you want to. That's up to you. All right. Read with your pencil. If you'll notice one thing, I have Phil's rules, and Phil's rules are read with your pencil. I do a lot of underlining. I like actually using a lot of color. I love the smart board software. And read with your finger. Read physically. Your brain moves a lot faster than your eyes. And I always do it that way because that's incredibly irritating. Your brain is telling your eyes, hurry up. Because when your eyes are reading something, they have to turn the shape of the letters into a sound. So your eyes are acting like ears. It's a really weird thing. I'll get into that in more detail. I do have a lecture on reading and, and sounds and how to study. And that's something I'll do on 8.30 prep later in the summer. But read with your pencil. Mark, underline, get out keywords. What Will said was weird words, proper nouns dates, names, anything that's capitalized. And I'll show you a couple of those too. Get some, let's get that back up there. Get some big words out. All right. And finally, where is the answer? You do not need to have any in-depth knowledge. The answer is always in the passage. The answer is in the passage. You need to find it. And you can practice this. This is a skill that you can get um, practiced, that you can practice and get better at. All right. And you do this by going to the question, reading the question, see if it has a keyword, and then reading the answer choices. And the answer choices all have keys. And the keys are, keys are words and phrases. And those words and phrases and their meanings, their definitions, have to be in the passage. The ACT is really good, and I am going to do that this summer once the coronavirus uh, thing kind of settles down and we get into some tests or I have some time. Maybe, maybe I've got the time now. Is I'm going to count some ACT questions and see how many of them are actual direct quotations. And I'll show you that in a couple of the questions that we've got here. The keywords. The thing you need to ask yourself is, is the keyword in the passage? Is it there? And they will put in wrong answers that exist in the passage. So the second question is, does it agree? Does it have agreement? My favorite SAT reading passage, I didn't take the time to look it up off of the old SATs, but it said um, the archaeologist looked beyond the shards. And an answer choice was that she primarily used pottery. So the key word in the passage was shards. And then the answer choice was pottery. And students would say to me, well, Phil, that's the key word. And a shard is a broken piece of pottery. They would say, there's a shard, there's a pottery. The key word's there. It's there. But in the passage, it said she looked beyond 
And in the answer choices, it said she primarily used. Primarily used. These two things don't agree. Looking beyond the shards isn't primarily using them. They didn't have agreement. Yes, it did say pottery. This was one of the biggest arguments I ever had with students all the time. It was she was looking beyond the shards. How she did that, I don't know. I don't care either. All right. I'm going to show you how literal this is. I have both SAT and ACT questions. I probably will do a whole week of reading for the SAT, a whole week of reading for the ACT when they finally set some real test dates and we can get back to being a society. And here's the question. Details in the passage most strongly suggest that the people meeting the narrator at the train station include her father, her sister, a neighbor, a journalist. Here's the passage. She says, suddenly I descended the two steps from the train. When you descend steps from a train, you are at a train station. This is the only mention of the train station, is the descend. If you descend a uh, train, if you descend from a train, from preposition, the preposition airplane, from the train, you are at a train station. You don't descend from a train any other place than a station. The porter handed me into one of the reunion scenes. Hi, honey. How was your trip? You get off the train, you get off the bus, you get out of your car, you come in from the airport, and somebody says to you, hi, honey. Who is that person? Who is the person who says, hi, honey? How was your trip? And there's pretty much only one person in the whole world who's going to call you honey after a trip, and that is your significant other or your mom. Did you get any sleep? Notice right here that the quotation marks end and new quotation marks begin. And that does it again, and then it does it again. And that is, in the English language, in one paragraph, if quotations end, another quotation begins, it's a dialogue. They are two different people talking. Normally we create paragraphs, but this is the ACT. They're trying to save space. And publishers would do that too because paper is expensive. Hi, honey, how was your trip? Did you get any sleep? A little. Been waiting long? long enough to be your dad. Who calls you honey and uses the word your dad? If I say to you your dad, I'm talking to you about your father. The answer choice, the only person at the train station mentioned is her dad, her father. Is her father there? Yes. Does it agree? Yes, because her mother was playing a game with him long enough to beat your dad in two great games of cribbage. I bet you most of you don't know what cribbage is, and I'm not going to describe it because it's a ridiculous game, and my roommate from college who loved to play it would never watch this. So would you, Andrew? No, there's no way he'd ever watch my YouTube show. All right, same passage. The woman goes back to her hometown. She's living in Chicago, and she goes back to Minnesota. And I think about progress a lot in the next few days and what passes for progress. This was the dot, dot, dot. She's back in the town. Question number four. It can be reasonably inferred from the passage that the narrator thinks her hometown has, and here's what I want you to do. Use your pencil and underline keywords. Has improved significantly made little genuine progress if you make little genuine progress you suck remained about the same has a chance of being rebuilt as it used to be let's go back and read the passage i think about progress a lot in the next few days and what passes for progress here is progress that is actually the answer. Little genuine progress and what passes for progress means that her hometown sucks. And that's what this passage is about. I come back to my hometown and it sucks. All right, next passage uh, on this same test. I won't mention which one it is, but if you tutor with me, you've done this test. And it says the main purpose of the second paragraph. Will would call this a narrow scope. Thank you very much, Will, for narrow scope. This is narrow because it tells you exactly where to read. 
Well, I'm not going to read lines 6 through 18. I'm going to read the answer choices. What I like to do is go second paragraph, 16, 6 to 18. I like to draw a line down the side of it like Will showed, uh, grouping out where the narrow, narrow scope, that was the word I was looking for, narrow scope questions are, because it helps you read, and then you go to the broad scopes. So let's take it, take a look at here. Draw attention to the Amazon's tremendous population growth. Explain the necessity for ventures such as Gomes. Explain the presence of the Ford Foundation. Justify raising taxes. Damien, let me ask you a question. Is justify raising taxes ever going to be the right answer ever? Uh, not that I know of. Not that he knows of. Um, I am going to be a little politically incorrect about some things here. And one of them is justifying raising taxes is never the answer ever. Okay? Even though the people who run the SAT and the ACT could be possibly considered liberal and <laughs> not possibly they're absolutely liberal they're educators they're and they believe in raising taxes and they can be bernie boys and feel the burn and they're gonna vote for joe biden they don't justify raising taxes this is always a wrong answer last week on thursday when i was uh doing grammar and i did phil's uh, answers that are always wrong that's something i should do for an in-depth reading week, week is answers that are always wrong all right, let's take a look. In this passage, is there a population? Yes. Is there ventures such as Reuben Gomes? Well, what does Reuben Gomes do? He, in many places, small-scale rural producers have been abandoned, credited with uh, what Reuben goes, founder of the workshop. Yes, he has a venture. A workshop is a venture. It's not an adventure, it is a venture and explain the presence of the Ford Foundation. Right up here, few people know the Amazon is one of the most rapidly urbanizing regions in the world, observes Jose Gabriel Lopez, a Ford Foundation program officer in Brazil. So, does that explain the presence of the Ford Foundation? No. Wrong. Does it draw attention to the, the tremendous population growth? Yes, it's right here. It's in the top part. Is it here in the bottom? No. Where's the primary purpose of a paragraph? Usually at the end. What's at the end? Gomes Workshop. It explains the necessity of Gomes Workshop because what's the necessity? What he is providing is hope. The necessity for his workshop is hope. All right. Here is another one. Look at the key words. The passage states that all of the following types of woods are traditionally used for making stringed instruments. All right. Well, this is, uh, who can say this for me? Anibia, uh, canalia. I don't even care. That's the other thing is there's words on here you can't pronounce, particularly in the science section when we do science week. Don't try to pronounce them. Just look at them and find them because I can find it right here. There it is. Here's rosewood. Let's see, here's rosewood, here's mahogany, here's mahogany, here's ebony, here's ebony. Oh, wait a second. All four answer choices are keywords. They all exist in the passage. I love questions that just have words as the answer choices because you can just find them. They're usually in the passage. Well, let's find them. They're all there. Let's see, four rosewood, four ebony, and for mahogany, and whatever this is, is substituted for ebony. So those were the traditional ones because they all have the same preposition in front of it, for. So the right answer is the one that is not traditional, the except, is answer choice A. Look, they all exist. Three of them didn't agree. Oh, three didn't agree. Four of them existed. <laughs> 
The, the SAT used to have five answer choices, and the math on the ACT this is why has you don't five. Get on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> Numbers are hard. <laughs> Numbers are hard for a math teacher. The ACT has still has five math answer choices, so I mostly do math. I'm used to doing that. There are four answer choices on reading. Three of them are wrong. Uh, there's a finger I should say on there. Okay. The passage indicates that as a group, the OLA, these are the people in the workshop that use Brazilian rainforest. It's about the rainforest. It's all going to be happy and sunshine and all that stuff. And that most of them, the people in the group, most of them what? Well, they care deeply enough about music to spend their lives making musical instruments. This is about saving the rainforest. They're going to return to their homes and spread environmental knowledge. Mm, spread environmental knowledge. Doesn't that sound nice and politically correct? It's the answer. They're willing to endure personal hardships in order to use their new skills. It, it doesn't say hardships. That's not there. They will have political careers. So most of them will have political careers. When the passage says that some of them will become politicians, I need to point this out to you. Politics exists in the passage, but it doesn't agree because some is not most. Where do most of them go? Let's uh, erase that because I wrote over it. Where do most of them go? Some 80%, guess what? 80% is most because that's more than half. Come from other parts of the Amazon is, 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 and virtually all of them return to their homes. Let's state that again. To their homes. To their homes. It's there and it agrees. And they spread environmental knowledge. Isn't that nice, cats and kittens? <laughs> Saw a nice meme on Joe. Uh, is it Joe Exotic? Is that his name? Yeah. Joe Exotic. Have you watched? Have you watched it, Damien? Have you watched it? You should waste a big part of your life and watch an hour of 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 uh, Tiger Kitten, whatever it's called, Tiger King. Okay. Tiger Kitten nailed it. Tiger Kitten nailed it. All right. Um, Gomes, what about the gomes? What about the gnomes? The gnomes in the rainforest, well, they're a different experience, Teo. All right, here's an SAT question, and here's one of my favorite styles of SAT questions, and that is the vocabulary most nearly means, or what we call vo vocabulary in context. So the word is used in context, and right here it says experience. It's underlined experience. It's somewhere in here. You might experience DNA damage. Experience most nearly means undergo, practice, withstand, or feel. All of these words, the way the SAT does this, all of these words, excuse me, can stand for experience at some place. For example, practice. I have experience on YouTube, though it doesn't look like it at all today, because I've practiced it. I feel, I experience the joy of being on YouTube. I can withstand, I can experience something that I really don't like. So that works too. So those are all good definitions. But when we put these words into the sentence to replace the word experience, interested in other ways frogs might experience DNA damage. What you want to do is break this down into subject, verb, object. Frogs experience damage. Frogs practice damage is ridiculous. Frogs withstand damage? Eh, might work. Frogs feel damage? Eh, no. What frogs do is they undergo damage. And to prove it to you, I went to my favorite app, dictionary.com. Because what is experience? As a verb, it means to undergo. This is exactly what the SAT does. Notice this. It is ordinal definition number six. They'd like to pick a regular word and use a definition that's a little bit further down the dictionary. Even though the first definition is a noun saying undergoing, which is a gerund, which we talked about during Grammar King week. All right, here we go. Which of the following statements, if spoken by the narrator, would best capture the sentiment of the narrator's comments 
in lines 76 to 79. I'm going to go to 76 to 79, and I'm going to look at these. And this one, let's go to some key words. Ready? I could tell that my father wished he had kept one of his baseball gloves. I'm going to say kept his baseball glove. It was if my father was scolding my glove for its design. My father bent my glove too forcefully. My father didn't want to try out my glove, considering that he had seen such better ones. He whapped his fist in it a few times and then took it with both hands and bent it. Oh, did he bent it? Yes, he did. Look, bent is there. Is it there? Our first question is, is it there? He bent it back and forth as if to reprimand it for the affectation of its deep pocket. Hmm. Scold. Reprimand. Let's go to dictionary.com. What's the definition of scolding? Number one, to reprimand. The word's meaning was there and it agreed. Which of the following questions is directly answered by the passage? Now, this looks like a very, very broad question. But as Will would say, look for uh, proper nouns. So what I see right here is massive software and BMT Asia Pacific. These are proper nouns. They are key words. I'm going to go. You can't really see this passage. But this is the whole mm -hmm. passage. And here's the question. Uh, I see, and I didn't turn off my, I didn't turn off my uh, my my vibr my my phone vibrator. I turned it off, and then I had it on my nightstand. And my wife texted me that she had made me breakfast, and I forgot to turn it back on. And I got my cold breakfast, so I'll leave the vibrator on. All right. As we're reading through this, one of the things, the reason I put this this passage that you can't read on here, is that Will said, "Look backwards." And I love that he said that because one of the things that I do is I'm going to show you how I read. And that is I'll put my finger on the passage and I'll read like this. I'll scan the passage back and forth with my eyes and my pencil. Now, I'm not actually going to write on it like that. I was just showing you the motion of my eyes. Because as I'm reading, what do I see right here? Massive and BMT Asia Pacific which is here. As I was reading with my fingers, they had this as an answer choice. And what does it do? Massive Software has been working with BMT, a marine consultancy, to model behavior of thousands of ships. What was the question? Which of the following questions is directly answer? What is the intended use of the software being developed by Massive and BMT? to track ships. That's the answer. So you can find this. This is a narrow scope because it's a proper noun. Look for proper nouns. Do I need to know anything about this passage at all to answer this question? No. Do I need to care? No. And that's why I say read like a boy. Don't care. Just answer the questions. Which of the following indicates that Terrazopoulos, I don't even know how to say that guy's name, accounted for which of the following situations in his commuter behavior at Penn Station. This question has a lot of keywords. It's got a proper noun. It's got two proper nouns. A dude, Pennsylvania Station, which is where the subways go uh, or the trains in New York City. One of them is one of them's the subways and one of them's the railroad. Grand Central Terminal and Pennsylvania Station. One of them is. I don't know New York that well. All right. What do we have? We have a train and a train, a commuter and a commuter. Grand, Grand Central Station what? Grand Central Station or my aunt's constipation. Anybody know what movie that's from? No. 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 Madagascar? Madagascar? Grand, Grand, Central, Grand Central Station or my, my aunt's, aunt's constipation. constipation? No, I didn't know that one. But uh, there's another movie with it that I won't mention. Can they say Grand Central Terminal, which is the um, post office? <laughs> the train is arriving behind schedule. The train is full. The commuter is lost. Or the commuter is late. 
So we're going to scan through the passage, and what are we going to look for? We're going to look for Terezopolis and Penn Station, and look what we find. We find Dr. Dimitri Terezopolis and the Pennsylvania Station in New York. He uses agents to simulate commuters who take a train. I actually can read that quickly, because what am I looking for? I'm looking from the keywords from the answers. Look what I found. All of them. I found the person's name, I found the station, I found commuters, and I found trains. And I also found the answer, he's running late. I love this about the ACT. The answer is, he is running late. This question would take me about 20 seconds to answer because it is such a narrow scope question. It has proper nouns, it's got short answers, and it has what I call the Dairy Queen, the direct quotation. I mean, this is like going to Dairy Queen and getting a nice soft serve vanilla ice cream cone because the answer is directly quoted in there. It's running late, that's all it is. None of the other words are in there. So when you read, all you have to look for is the key words. Do I need to care anything else about this? No. I don't have to care, and I don't have to get involved, and I don't have to make any emotional connections. All right. Here's one of the last questions, and that is, the author of Passage B, everybody hates Passage A, Passage B, the first passage, the second passage, and the actor who plays Laurie represents, let's see, why a British production can't capture the essence of a musical concerned with the national character of the United States. I brought this one up because rarely, if ever, are women criticized. There's a couple things about the SAT and the ACT. And first off is, there are only two genders in the reading on the SAT and the ACT, and in the math. If it says men and women, there are only men and women. There are no other genders. It's a binary test. They might get into that later on, but I seriously doubt it. They just say men and women, and this is about a woman. They rarely, if ever, criticize a woman unless they're saying something nice about her. And I wanted to point this out because they're actually criticizing the actor who plays Laurie. Let's go to the passage. And it's about a British production of the American musical by Rodgers and Hammerstein, Oklahoma, which I happen to have performed in when I was a theater geek in high school. I was Willow Parker. Nerd. I am a nerd. This is this is math nerd. It start, started off with math nerd. The linchpins of the show are Aunt Uller. Eller, played by the gritty droll comedian Andrea, who is an American, and nails it. The American nails it. Guess what, folks? This is called the ACT. And take one guess what the A stands for. America. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. It used to stand for the American College Test. It doesn't actually stand for anything anymore, except for it's the American College Test. All right? She's an American, and she nails it. And the feisty, lovelorn Lori, played by the fine-voiced compliment, demure compliment, Josephine Gabriella, who is English and doesn't. Oh, wait a second. She doesn't what? She doesn't nail it. It's not talent that's at issue here. So we're not saying that Josefina Gabriella is not talented. Gabriella is the first laureate to dance her own dream ballet. She's a ballerina and she can sing and she can play the lead. It's about national character. Wait, wait, wait a second, wasn't that a key word? Uh, national character? It's about national character? Guess what? That's the answer. This is one of the few times that the ACT will actually criticize a nation or a person, a female, who is not American. <laughs> but she's British, so she's white. So here's what the ACT and the SAT do. The SAT do. Here's what the ACT and the SAT does. They break people into two genders, male and female. Women are rarely, if ever, criticized. Notice they said something nice about this woman. Men can be criticized because we know men suck. The other thing they break people into is 
white Western Europeans and Americans and non-whites. Non-whites are never criticized. Whites can be criticized, particularly British people, because we all know British people, well, we all, uh, we all can't say that. This is talking about national character. This is about the American grit. And the Brits just don't pull it off, okay? They lack the American sense of gumption, a combination of buoyancy and backbone. We're like, America, yeah, yeah, rah, rah, America. But if she was African, it wouldn't be on here. If she was Latina, it wouldn't be on here. She just happens to be British. She has a non-British name, so she's probably French or Spanish. Uh, all right, we're going to end here. How do you do this? Study backwards. Take some of the TIRs, Test Information Release, QAS. Go on to my favorite website, Reddit, where I was on today, downloading some illegal SATs. Take a reading section. Mark the right answer. Find it in the passage. Match the keywords. Go through it. Online today, I found over 120 SATs and ACTs. Reading is reading. The key is finding the key in the passage. I'm Phil McCaffrey. This is 8.30 Prep. I'll see you next week for Conjunction Junction, What's Your Function? And Damien, you better make me some good thumbnails. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Okay.